Okay, so hyaloclastite, um, uh, based natural pozzolani, uh, as a substitute for fly ash, slag, silica film, or um, any other pozzolan. Um, so um, again, what is hyaloclastite? Is lava uh, quenched by water? Is nature's way of um, similarly of how you make um, you know uh, uh, blast furnace uh, slag? So in a typical subarea lava eruption, the lava cools slowly, um, you know, uh, in the air. And um, this is um, a little, you know, um, illustration of how it cools and how the vesicles uh, form and so on. Uh, when you have a lava eruption, uh, normally uh, at the bottom of uh, the ocean or uh, under a glacier, water uh, quenches the lava. And um, what it does is it, it, it shatters the lava in small particles and it arrests uh, crystal formation, which basically means is a volcanic class. So <clears throat> in this particular deposit that's uh, in the US, um, this took place uh, at the bottom of Lake Bonneville. And it's even different than, than other um, similar eruptions in the sense that the lava traveled to uh, a number of deep uh, aquifers and water got injected into the um, uh, vent, into the lava column. And as it traveled through it pre-quenched, it um, mixed, you know, the water mixed um, and created uh, with the lava and created steam and it accelerated the eruption um, and by the time that the lava hit the bottom of the cold water lake, uh, it basically shattered uniformly in sand-like uh, material. So we, um, we, we process this material in a number of different particle sizes. Uh, here we're going to share with you some data on four um, and eight micron uh, D50 particle size. And the first thing that we did is we tested it for ASTM compliance uh, with different type of cements and uh, side by side with fly ash. In this particular case, <clears throat> we've used some um, type two five cement uh, from Mitsubishi, uh, California Cushionberry plant. And as you can see here, um, <clears throat> it has in, in some ways better uh, strength activity index than uh, fly ash available in that market. Um, then from there, um, this is, you know, um, the, the cement and the, and the test data. Um, this is ASTM 618 uh, certification. I'm gonna fast forward through this so that I can turn it over to uh, Neil um, and he can present a more in-depth um, uh, research um, analysis. Okay, uh, so what we did is we said this, uh, this material has the possibilities of replacing fly ash, slag, silica fume, uh, metacalin, and we wanted to find out, you know, if we used it in a little bit higher performance mixes than we saw in the previous speakers, um, talk to see whether or not we can um, get high dur good durability because durable mixes tend to be uh, sustainable versus a non-durable one. So we looked at the various factors you looked at and we looked at um, besides, uh, and we were uh, especially concerned about uh, transport properties. So we measured conductivity and, and I'm only gonna show you up to 90 days here, but when we meet again in San Francisco, we'll go farther out, but we measured um, worried about ASR performance. And we can see that the typical is done for 14 days, but um, you can see fly, uh, compared to uh, the, the control con uh, border failed at 0.15, you're supposed to be under 0.1. And fly a uh, small amount of fly ash just made it as silica fume. When we carried it out to 28 days, and, and we typically are doing that now for mixes that are supposed to have 100 year plus design lives, and when we do that, you can see that uh, a fly ash at a small dosage did not make it. And even the silica fume at a 10% dosage did not make it. But uh, uh, the metacalin made it, and as did the two um, uh, 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 SCMs that were the new um, 
materials we're talking about here. And uh, you can see they had fairly large reductions in, uh, in ASR uh, uh, expansion to, compared to the controls and to uh, other factors. Now we did concrete mixes then. Concrete mixes were at a 0.38 water to cementitious ratio, uh, representing what you would uh, you start seeing in uh, high, more high performance mixes. And uh, for my friends in Japan, I apologize for the English units, but 658 is somewhere or, uh, around um, uh, somewhere around 390, I think, on, uh, on kilograms. But anyway, if you look at that, we can see that um, when we use the new material, we use the newer material. We have we, uh, how we did the mixes, and you can get air entrainment in them. There's not a problem um, getting air and the, the slumps are about the same. And we actually ended up using a little less uh, super plasticizer and then we, need, then we did for the uh, metacalin or the silica fuel and almost comparable with the fly ash. Next slide, Mario, Romeo. So anyway, when we look at the, you get the plastic properties that you know you can meet good get good plastic properties in this higher performance concrete the setting times are close to or the last two columns are the ones we're interested in there the, and the first columns the control you can see they're a little they're they're a little bit faster than the control similar uh part the control for control one and second control we have to work with that so they're about the same as the control Whereas you can see a fly ash mixes are doing a fair amount of, are doing some retardation versus the control. Uh, not a big problem in the summertime, but in the winter that might be a, a problem. And you can see that it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's doing, uh, they're doing quite well there. So equipment setting time, good workability. Next slide. And mechanical properties, um, you got the first set of controls compared to this uh, material, the, the standard materials, and you can see they get um, fly ash even at, uh, at 90, it took 90 days for fly ash to get the equipment to the control strength wise. Obviously the silica fume and metacalin did very well, but we look at the PVT at both four and eight microns, which turned out to be fairly equivalent here. They're better than the control or uh, at 28 days, they're already doing better than the control and they're very close to control at early times. You can see the strength developments of these materials and uh, they're acting more like um, silica fume and um, metacalin as far as strength development than fly ash. Next slide. Uh, free stall is important. So we ran, we ran free stall tests and you can see, and you can see the durability factor is equivalent to the control. And uh, they did quite well there. Uh, beams look perfect when they came out. Uh, transport properties, which is, uh, we can be using various modeling. The transport properties we looked at uh, were both conductivity. The conductivity over time gives you an idea as to how the concrete's gonna get uh, less permeable over a period of time. Uh, we looked at also the bulk diffusion, uh, ASMC 1556, and we uh, and we and we also looked at uh, capillary absorption, uh, and we did also NT build, and which is um, also another uh, factor which is also used in some models. And in all cases, relative to the fly ash, uh, uh, fly ash, it, it had a much lower diffusion coefficient than what the fly ash did at earlier days, and it. Um, and its conductivity stopped, it kept getting lower in time too. So now we did act alike. You can see in this slide, the kind of uh, steep slopes coming down in time, whereas uh, uh, concrete started high and it came down slowly, but metacalin and silica fume pretty much are not getting much better in time, but uh, we're doing much better on, the, on, on uh, these, these, uh, these new materials. Not only do they have lower initial Diffusion coefficients than fly ash, they keep getting lower in time like fly ash. So for durability purposes, they're quite good. Next slide. So we started to look at, uh, you know, predicted times of corrosion for a bridge deck. Uh, we use Salt Lake City as a severe example, and we use Life 365, but we have the data that we can use either, uh, we can use uh, the FIP model with it. We have the FIP the data for that. We also could use a more advanced models like Stadia. But uh, for, this, uh, for the simplicity here, we're just showing a Life 365 model. And you can see we, uh, what we have is, uh, this is a typical, uh, typical deck design. And if you look at 
um, how these uh, the, the ticket lifetimes. You can see that uh, uh, typically you want things to last 100 years. The 0 0.005 is the, the boundary where you would have uh, initiation of corrosion. Then you have some time after that uh, for the failure. So you see in the case of using the well, PVD 70, uh, the 70 at eight and four microns, you, you'll have a long design life here. Whereas when you're looking at the um, Flash and some of these others in the controls, they're not they're getting less than half the life that you would uh, half of that hundred years. So, from a sustainability point of view, uh, you'd have to make the, you'd have to use twice as much material or even more to rebuild the bridge, uh, the deck to get to where the life is here. So, how many are we uh, saving in the the cost of the uh, the cost of the cement on both CO two and uh, uh, we're also saving on the, we're also saving on having the material lasting water. So I'll argue that you don't have sustainability unless you have durability. Next slide, please. You also want to see an idea how they behave in isothermal calorimetry. This gives you an idea how efficient it is in, uh, in generating, uh, uh, generating strength and uh, whether, and whether or not it would be useful or not in mixes where, where you need to uh, reduce the heat of the mix, such as mass concrete. So you can see the cement uh, uh, produced 33,000 uh, joules, and we're getting uh, joules per gram of cement is like 337. Um, we put fly ash in at 20%, we can see reduce the heat, total heat coming out, which is well known for fly ash. And um, the, amount of, and the amount of joules we get per gram of cement goes up a little bit. So the fly ash is actually adding something to it. It's a less heat than the cement because you have less cement, you have totally less cement there, even though the joules per gram is higher. So it makes the cement more efficient. Both PVTs uh, make the cement uh, pretty much equivalent to each other, also lower the total heat produced but produce more, um, makes it much more efficient as to the 377 and 380 versus the 363 for fly ash or 337 for the cement alone. Metacalin is extremely efficient, gets up to 4, uh, 404. However, it's so efficient, it's actually increasing the heat generated by the mix at a 10% uh, replacement level. So if you were looking for mass concrete, metacalin in this case would not be a viable alternative to uh, to replace cement with. Uh, the silica, silica fumes a little bit um, better, and uh, but it's not as efficient as either the fly ash or the, or the uh, even as the fly ash because you didn't, re in this case, show me replacing 10% of the cement versus 20 with, 20 with the fly ash. So we get uh, a nice thing of improving cement efficiency with lowering overall heat output in contrast to metacaline, which will increase the heat produced. Next slide. This just shows the isothermal calorimetry curves. If we go to the peaks uh, and uh, go to half of that, we get an idea of the setting times. But basically, this is where um, the, the data you showed earlier, I showed earlier is coming off these curves. I don't know if you want to talk about carbon footprint, Martin Romeo? Yeah, a little bit. So <clears throat> this is a natural occurring uh, uh, you know, mineral. Um, however, is very rare. Um, most of, um, if not all the natural pozzolans um, used are a product of, of a sub aerial eruption such as, um, um, you know, pumice or um, volcanic ash. Um, and so I'm, I'm not gonna have the time to get too much into detail about um, the, the difference, but it is the difference in a sense of a air cooled product, which is, uh, the volcanic ashes and the um, um, the um, uh, pumices versus this uh, uh, lava quenched by water. There is something uh, different in performance of a process material from lava quenched by water than lava that erupted in the air and cooled um, by uh, you know slower by air. Um, so um, in, in this case, um, basically the, the carbon footprint is uh, um, dependent on the type of energy used to mine and process the material. The processing is mechanical processing, reducing it in size 
um, through a ball mill and depending on the source of electricity and what their carbon footprint is, um, if we had <clears throat> um, um, a um, um, mining footprint of about 10 kilograms per ton, and then we have uh, we have some drying of material to do prior to uh, to grinding. So overall, um, it, it is less than 100 kilograms a ton of, um, of of this material compared to you know seven eight hundred kilograms per ton of OPC. Um, so that is um, um, that is the 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 product and the benefits from the U.S. Uh, there are other sources that we have tested in the European market um, as well, but um, this is the U.S. Uh, product. So thank you very much. Emails on the screen, contact information. So thank you very much for your presentation, Romeo and Neil. Thank you very much.